are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. Yeah. 
right? That no matter what you hear in the news, no matter how loud that voice is, that God is still good. And no matter what, he won't let you down. Though the earth may tremble and quake, Though the mountains may tumble and fall, though the ocean roar and foam, and the mountains be thrown into the heart of the sea, we will not fear. There's a river that makes glad the cities of God. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, and God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. perfect, and you, Tiwan, I don't pay that much attention to college football, but I know that you, Tiwan, and that Vandy didn't. <laughs> On Friday night, a friend of mine's daughter got married. 
and uh, he asked me as a favor to play some music at the wedding, and this is one of the songs they had in the middle of the ceremony. It's very cool to have this be a part of a wedding.
going to invite the kids to go ahead and be dismissed to their classrooms this morning. The rest of us, let's stay standing, shake hands with one another, do a little meet and greet time, say hi to the people you're with this morning. All right, everybody, come on in, grab a seat. Uh, if this is your first time to Fellowship Nashville or you're new here, you're in good company because, hey, I'm fairly new here. So if I've not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is Ryan. I serve as pastor of teaching and discipleship here. This is my second week here at Fellowship, and uh, it is just an honor to be with you guys as we come into this time of worship. Uh, there are a number of things I'd love to point your attention to as we get started today. Uh, number one, we would love to have the opportunity to connect with you. And so if you could text, if you're new to Fellowship and would love to find out more, uh, text to 81010 at FNASH Guest. Gives us a great opportunity to connect with you and encourage you wherever you are uh, on your journey. Now, speaking of uh, just opportunities to connect, there are a number of ways that you can get connected uh, in the weeks ahead. Number one, for all you guys, coming up next weekend is our men's camp out, October 14 and 15 over at Kentucky Lake. We do need you to sign up by Tuesday, though, so that we can get an accurate head count of who's coming. And so if you've not yet had a chance to sign up, uh, go online, uh, register for that so that uh, you can go and be a part of connecting with other guys. Now, gals, there's a number of opportunities coming up as great times to connect. Number one, there's a women's retreat coming up. Uh, information is available on the website, December 2 to 4. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. Uh, secondly, there is a women's connection event coming up uh, on October 23rd at 1.30. Uh, this is just a great chance to get to know some other gals uh, in the church and to have the opportunity to... Uh, learn more about uh, life at Fellowship and to get connected. Uh, lastly, if you just want to stay connected in what's going on here at Fellowship, uh, just snap a picture of this QR code, go to the website, and you'll be able to sign up there. With that, um, we're going to prepare our hearts to take this morning's offering. Uh, just to remind you, there's an offering box in the back, or you can give online. And so as we prepare to do that, uh, let's pray. So Lord, thank you for your amazingly ridiculous generosity to us. God, you give to us beautifully and wonderfully. And God, we pray that as we return uh, some of these gifts to you, God, that you would use this for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, that you would multiply its effectiveness and you'd be glorified. And so, Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we give you praise in your name. Amen? Amen. All right, well, with that, I have the honor and privilege of welcoming Levi up, and Levi is going to lead us in the Word today. Let's give him a hand as he comes up. Wow, thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Crushing it. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, guys. <laughs> Everybody's here. It's good to see you guys. Uh, Jeremy is absolutely right. The Vols did win this week. Feels so good. So good, undefeated, and this is when Levi's hopes are climbing and climbing and climbing, and then the third weekend of October is next week, which either means I'm going to come in here with song and dance or with lament, one of the two, because Alabama is either going to crush us or we are going to barely squeak by. Um, I'm hoping for the latter, but uh, we will see how it goes, and I hope, my hope is still very high, as is 
every single year. Um, yeah, this doesn't usually go well, but I'm, I, the hope is there. The hope is there. Uh, it is good to see you guys this morning. Um, regardless if the Vols had won or not, I'm really glad to see you all, and I'm, I'm pumped to be here. Um, for those of you who weren't here uh, last week and you didn't get to hear Pastor Ryan teach on Revelation chapter 1, I would encourage you to go back and watch it. He did an incredible job. But he kicked off our study um, that we are continuing today on the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And uh, if you, uh, in essence, just kind of as a summary, in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation, uh, we see Jesus give messages, unique messages, to each of these seven churches that are around in the ancient Near East. And as we walk through each of these letters, not only do we learn about what Jesus expects of each of these churches, but also what he expects of the churches in the modern day. Uh, today we're going to be looking at that first letter. It's the letter to the church at Ephesus. And uh, we, we know a lot about the city of Ephesus from Scripture. We get to see a lot of Ephesus, um, namely from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, but also in the book of Acts uh, through Paul's missionary journeys there. Uh, quick history lesson for you guys, just because history is cool and just gives us a little bit of context. Uh, Ephesus was one of the more uh, populated, famous, and important cities in Asia uh, during the first century. You can see on the, the map behind me, it was uh, a port city, and uh, it acted as this sort of intersection of all the major trade routes of the day. Additionally, it was the epicenter, uh, or one of the many epicenters of worship in the ancient Near East, housing one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, something called the Temple of Artemis. It was this giant temple, even bigger than the Parthenon, and people would come from all over the place, across country boundaries and everything, just to see this temple. It was a very big deal. And because of all the social and spiritual activity in Ephesus, um, Ephesus wasn't only a strategic city culturally, but it was also a strategic city for the Christian movement. So basically what I want you guys to know about Ephesus is that it was very spiritually and culturally eclectic, and that the Christian movement, based on what we know in Scripture, apparently flourished there. But despite all the hard work that the community of believers did in Ephesus to expand the church, they did make some critical mistakes. Um, in this passage, we could see Jesus do this technique that I like to call, and I'm sure you guys have heard this term before, of a compliment sandwich. Have you guys heard that before? Yeah. I chose a bologna sandwich because that's, like, long story short, I actually really enjoy bologna sandwiches, and my wife, my wife is out of town, and whenever she's out of town, I get really lonely, and so I like to buy little, little like, treats for myself to, to tide me over till she gets home. And ever since we've been married, I always buy supplies for a bologna sandwich. That's like my treat, because we don't usually keep bologna in the house, and so I'm like, get, I've been eating a lot of bologna and cheese sandwiches this week. Um, there's a reason we don't keep it in the house, but it's, I, I really enjoy it. Um, but y'all, most of y'all probably know what this is. It's essentially whenever you squeeze a, a rebuke or, a, or a, a point of growth that you would like to see in someone or a group of people in between compliments to try and get a point across that you're doing a great job, but there could be some improvement. Um, I asked my wife before she left on her, on her trip if she could think of any practical examples. And so uh, I've got this one for you of me doing laundry. This is me. I'm, I'm projecting what my wife, I'm paraphrasing what my wife said to me. Essentially, this is like a few months ago. She said, Levi, you're doing such a good job. You're doing all this laundry. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. Uh, it's really helpful, but just a heads up, you know those new work pants I just bought? You can't just hang them and drape them over on the drying rack. You have to hang them up on the specific hanger because if you don't, it's not going to dry right and it's gonna get, it might get a little mildewy. But you're amazing and you're adorable and I love you so much and all this other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I love compliment sandwiches. I'm a big fan of compliment sandwiches. I respond very well to that. And Jesus speaks a little compliment sandwich type deal over the church of Ephesus except his rebuke or his correction of what they forgot is obviously way more important than a pair of moldy work pants. This rebuke is just as applicable to us today. So, if y'all could open your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 
Um, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, we will have it on the screen behind me. If you don't have a copy at all, like at home or, or whatever, we should have some copies at the Connect Point. We want you guys to have a physical copy of God's Word. Um, so if you are passing by the Connect Point and you need one, just grab a Bible. We want you all to have that. So if you all follow along, I'll read for us Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God." Would you all pray with me this morning? Lord, thank you for today. For the time that we get to spend in your word, Lord, give us open minds and open hearts to receive what you want us to this morning. We love you so much, and it's because you loved us first. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. All right, let's dive in. Verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks among the seven golden lampstands. John is recording the words of the one who holds the seven stars and walks among the seven lampstands. And we know by looking back at Revelation chapter 1, again, if you haven't listened to the sermon from last week, do it. It's awesome. But if we look back in chapter 1, this one, this one who holds the stars is Jesus. And according to Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, the lampstands represent the churches and the stars represent the angels of those churches. Now, some of your translations might say uh, messengers of the church instead of angels of the church. And uh, this, this Greek word messenger is, and this is in my southern accent, is the Greek word angelos. It's a better way of pronouncing that, I'm sure, I'm sure of it. And it's where, we get our, it's where we get our English word for angel. And it can refer to either an earthly messenger or a heavenly messenger, a, a spiritual being messenger. Um, and the context of these verses helps us decide which is which. And in the book of Revelation, John uses this word to refer to both earthly and heavenly messengers. Um, I've heard an argument for both um, in this specific passage, but I tend to think that John, again, in this specific passage, is talking about an earthly messenger. But regardless, this message is from Jesus being sent to the leadership in the churches. Uh, specifically in the church of Ephesus. Verse 2 and 3. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. This is the first compliment of Jesus' little compliment sandwich. Jesus knows the life these Christians in Ephesus are living, And he commends all of the work that they've done. From their visible toil of advancing the gospel to the passive work and the unseen endurance at a heart level, Jesus praises them for their dedication and how, despite their struggle, they have not grown weary bearing the name of Jesus. Jesus also commends them for their work at calling out false teachers. Apparently, this was a very common thing in the city of Ephesus. Paul was worried about this when he warned the the people of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 30, when he said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men seeking, uh, speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. The people of Ephesus apparently took Paul's words to heart and did not fall into these ruts of false teaching. And if someone claimed to be commissioned by Jesus Christ, the church would test them to make sure that, they're, that they had sound doctrine and they weren't twisting the gospel in ways that it shouldn't be. 
Jesus first praises the Ephesian church for their doctrinal vigilance and spiritual endurance. They have refused to add or subtract anything from God's word and persevered through the hardships that they faced in the city of Ephesus. Verse 4. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. The first half of the rebuke of this compliment sandwich, Jesus tells them that they have, been, that they have given up their first love. This Greek word for first can also be translated as chief or primary, the most important love. Jesus doesn't explicitly mention what this first love is, which means the interpretation can go kind of back and forth. But given the context, I would be hard-pressed to say that the most important love, the first and primary love, could be anything outside of Jesus. The moment you first fell in love with Christ is the moment you experienced your first love, that he died for you, that he loves you despite your imperfection, that you were loved and you deserve, or rather you desire to serve him and grow in relationship with him. And because you loved him, you in turn were called to love others This first love is naturally going to leak into other parts of your life. The prophet Jeremiah talks about this very issue of forgetting your first love as Israel abandons the Lord in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. The word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed, past tense, followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Jeremiah, like Jesus, is proclaiming to the people, you've forgotten what drove you to me, the heart that you had for the Lord, the desire you had to serve and know him. Why do we love Jesus in the first place? 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Our love and desire to serve God doesn't happen unless... He loves us first. That's what's so amazing. That's what's so cool about this. It's not this, I love you, God, and he goes, oh, good, I love you too. It's, I love you, Levi, and I say, I love you too. Jesus said, I love you first in the relationship. The church at Ephesus was absolutely on point with their doctrine and their perseverance of the gospel. But they forgot about their first love. The reason they started doing all these wonderful things in the first place has been forgotten, and now it's more task and action-oriented. They were doing these things because it's what they're supposed to do as Christians. And it's good that they're doing these things. Jesus tells them that. But without a heart behind it, something's missing. Obedience is about the heart behind the action, not the action by itself. I was reminded of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I was actually talking to uh, Natalie and Charlie Smith this morning about this. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongue of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but I have not love I am nothing if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but I have not love I gain nothing in this passage Paul is speaking against the Corinthians using their gifts to gain status and position If you've lost sight of God's love and in turn have lost the passion and the desire to serve and follow Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do. Your words are clanging symbol. Your knowledge is worthless to you. Your sacrifice gains you nothing. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. 
Remember, Jesus has already told them they're doing all the right stuff. Like, you're, you're doing it right. Sound doctrine, you're, you're, you're doing that. False teachers, not happening. They've just forgotten their first love. This means that Jesus sees the actions that we do without love as different than the actions we do with love. He says, remember the actions you did. Like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, your works without a heart of love are different actions than the heart with love. We're in Tennessee. We're in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. I was raised, I was raised in Tennessee. Jesus has just said, you're doing it all right. You have sound doctrine. You are all, false teachers. You are, you are getting them out. You are, no, not happening. You test them, false teacher, get out, not happening. You are, no. And he says, if you don't have, if you have forgotten your first love, re repent. This should, like, this should blow our Bible Belt brains. Like, this is, this is paradigm shifting. At least it is for me. Like, we, it's not, it's not, it's in the culture that you're raised in, that I was raised in. Just, just do, like, do the right things. And Jesus says, that's a good thing. You're supposed to do the right thing. But if you don't have a heart that longs for your first love, you're missing it. Jesus then calls for repentance. Repentance after he has just said that they're doing all of this stuff right. You're doing all the right actions, but you don't have your first love, so repent. Like I'm reading it and my, the, my cultural brain is like is having a hard time connecting that. I don't know if that's the same thing for you guys. Jesus calls for repentance for doing good things, really good and important things without a heart of love behind it. What like what do we repent from? What what is like if we're repenting, we're doing something and we are doing a 180 turn, and we're saying we're not doing that anymore. Like this language of like sinfulness, if we are doing good things without a heart that is longing our first love for Jesus, that should blow our minds, in the, especially in the South. We are so good at doing good things, and a lot of times there is no heart longing for Jesus behind those good things. That's, that is Christian culture paradigm shifting. That is nuts. Jesus adds extra weight to that. If Ephesus doesn't repent, if Ephesus doesn't do a full 180 from their great doctrine and perseverance without remembering their first love, the punishment is a removal of the lampstand. As a reminder from last week, the lampstand, this is some cool, it took every bit of me, I, I, there's so much information here and I didn't have enough time to like rehash all of it, but it's so cool and so fascinating. But again, Ryan did a great job covering it last week. The lampstand in the tabernacle or in the temple was the only source of light in the place, in the holy place. And it was symbolic of Yahweh's presence, the Lord's presence in the temple, in the tabernacle. Jesus is saying that the punishment for this church that is doing everything right, except they have abandoned their first love, is judgment. I will remove my lampstand from you the pr presence removed. 
Cultural Christianity is so dangerous. It is so dangerous because we get so good at doing it all right based on our idea of what is right. Jesus calls the church at Ephesus to repent and to remember the works that they were from, that they were doing from a heart bursting with a desire to know Jesus as you realize how deeply you are loved by Jesus. Verse six. This is our final compliment in our compliment sandwich. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. After reminding the church of Ephesus that judgment awaits them if they are without their first love, Jesus jumps back in with a, and yet you don't like the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, so that's good. I don't want to spend uh, a ton of time on the Nicolaitans since the main reason that they're mentioned is, is essentially their, uh, their false teachers. That's kind of the overarching, but history is very cool, so here's a quick snippet. Basically, the Nicolaitans were, were kind of like a, a sect of Christianity and of the church, I should say, and they had compromised on a lot of the doctrine that the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus had done a really good job holding on to. The Nicol Nicolaitans, I can't even say it, had compromised in this pagan society and had taken the concept of spiritual freedom to an extreme giving the go-ahead to things like idolatry and sexual immorality. And they were taking the teachings of Scripture in the New Covenant and twisting them into something that they weren't. Jesus is using a specific example to commend the church of Ephesus for standing against false doctrine. And people like the Nicolaitans who take the word and twist it, who... who Take the concept of spiritual freedom and twist it. That, that is present even today. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Every one of these seven letters will end with two super powerful phrases. Number one, he who has an ear, let him hear. And number two, to the one who conquers. So I'm going to go over those very briefly uh, for y'all real quick. The first, he who has an ear, let him hear. Many of y'all might recognize that phrase. Uh, be like, didn't Jesus say that? He absolutely did. Uh, Jesus says a very identical phrase in each of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Jesus is saying, it's not enough to have ears. Everybody has ears. You need to have ears to hear. You need to have a spiritual ear, an ear inclined to understand, to have understanding on a heart level. Jesus chooses to include this at the end of each of his seven letters. And so we have to ask the question, why? Because it's not enough for noise to just bounce off your eardrum. In the case of the church at Ephesus, it's not enough just to do what you know you're supposed to do without having a heart behind it. You must have a deeper and fuller understanding, an understanding only the Spirit of God can give. Second, each of these churches ends with the statement, to the one who conquers. Uh, the ESV says conquers, but some of your translations might say the one who is victorious or the one who overcomes or the one who prevails. This is a Greek word referring to like the end of a battle. After you have fought hard through this life, after you have persevered and come out on the winning side with ears that have heard and a heart that has been changed, you will eat of the tree of life. That tree of life also should raise some references in your brains for you guys. You might be thinking of the book of Genesis. That's good. Garden of Eden. Paradise. In fact, that word for paradise in the Greek, another way to translate it, so cool, is the word garden. Garden. That's super cool. And actually, in, in uh, Genesis, in the Greek translation of Genesis, the word that they use for garden, the Garden of Eden, is the same word that John uses here. So it all kind of works together. The tree of life was at the center of the garden. 
the Holy of Holies, the place where Jesus' presence is, presence is in the tabernacle and in the temple. As we go through these letters, the reward Jesus highlights for the overcomers is different from each church, or for each church. So why, why highlight this one for Ephesus? Like all of these rewards are very tangible, but why does he specifically highlight this for Ephesus? Ephesus is great at the what, at the what aspect of faith, but not always great at the why. They work and work and work. False teachers, not happening. Gospel spread, you betcha. Following every single commandment, absolutely. Ephesus gets the job done. But why do they do it? Why do we do any of it? Jesus reminds the Ephesians what awaits believers after all their hard work, an eternity of rest in the presence of God. That's what it's about. He says, I know you're working. You're doing it all right. But this is what, like, this is what we're waiting for. When you finish, you get to rest in me, rest in Jesus. These letters are written to specific churches at specific times in history. But as we walk through each of them, we're, uh, I hope that you guys notice some stuff. We're going to realize that, like I said at the beginning, that Jesus is calling each of these churches, what he's calling them for is also something that the churches in the present need to reflect for better or for worse, or can reflect. I don't know about y'all, but I relate a lot to the church in Ephesus. I kind of touched on that earlier, especially being raised in this neck of the woods. Sound doctrine for, like I said, this area, for our neck of the woods, is the most important thing that we have. Most of the churches around it, it all starts with sound doctrine. That's where it starts, which helps us to push, push against false teachers and we build from there. That's a good thing. Sound, like, again, I, I, I feel like we as humans have this tendency, and I really, like, I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of harping on this a little bit, but I feel like we as humans go, all right, what's priority and what's secondary? And we go, this is number one, and we go, sweet, don't have to do that anymore. That's not what I'm saying. Because that's what the church at Ephesus did. They said, this is the most important. Jesus is like, you forgot about this. It really should be here. I'm not saying this is number one, forget everything else. They're both pivotal. They're both so important. Here's what I'm getting at. This is kind of the, uh, uh, Pastor Ryan and I kind of workshop this phrase, and I really, really like it a lot. In the kingdom of God, the why is often more important than the what. Which again, for our neck of the woods, that feels that might feel weird. Many of us can easily get wrapped up in our plans and in our systems. Sound, do sound doctrine and a disdain for false teachers is a good thing. Jesus literally praises the church at Ephesus for their hard work and their hate for false teachers. He literally says, you hate the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Jesus is like, I hate false teaching. That is a good thing to be against. But without their first love, they're missing the mark. Asking the what is important, but asking the why is a first importance. Why do we keep sound doctrine? Why do I speak against false teachers? Why do I pray? Why do I help those in need? Why do I volunteer? Why am I kind to people? Why do I come to church? Why do I come to church events? What's the point? Why do I tithe? Why do I wait to have sex until marriage? Why do I love my enemies? Why do I flee from temptation? Why do I stand for the widow and the orphan and the sojourner? Why do I read God's word? Why do I love my enemy? Is it so you won't feel guilty? Is it so you will feel important? Is it so you'll be admired for status in your, your, your church bubble, your church community? 
Is it to stave off all of the really difficult questions that you know you have but you're afraid to ask? Is it to check a box on your to-do list? I'm really, really good at that. I'm great at box checking. I love a good list. I'm not trying, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm not, not trying to make you feel shame. I already have enough of that in my own body as it is. We don't need more of it. But as much as Christians bolster the importance of what we need to do and what is important, we aren't always the best at why we do it and why it's important. I'm going to read a little section from Psalm 119. And uh, as I read this, uh, the band can slowly make their way back up. And I, I, it kind of jumped out at me while I was studying. And it's more of a prayer that we have a posture like this. Um, this is, I'm, it's Psalm 119. I'm not going to read all of it. It's the longest psalm. We don't have enough time to do all of Psalm 119. But uh, it's going to be verses 97 through 104 and 129 through 136. Um, I'm not going to have it behind me. I'm just going to read it over you. But I pray we have a posture like this. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order, that you, in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. Your, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise and let not iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because people do not keep your law. Your law is like honey. I pant for your commandments. My eyes stream tears because people don't keep your law. I want that passion. I want that zeal. I want that desire. The psalmist is like, I, the Lord, I want, like when he says law, like the law, like the Pentateuch, like all this Old Testament stuff, we always skip over. He says, it's like honey on my tongue. That's not, I better eat this sweet, delicious thing. He's like, I want your, I want to know what you have for me, God. I pant, like When you see a dog panting, he's not like, I've just had something great. He's like, I need water. I'm so thirsty. He's longing for the commandments of God. He's panting after God's commandments. Eyes streaming with tears. He sees people not keeping God's law, and he is brought to tears. I want that. The what is good. The what is, again, I I really want to stress that. The what is good. Commandments from God are so good. Obedience is good. Jesus tells us, go into the gospel. Jesus says, follow my commandments. Do what I've instructed you to do. That is a requirement. You have to do that. If you want to follow me, if you're going to follow me, that's, you can't follow someone and say, I'm only going to choose. No, are you following me? You're keeping my commandments. You're obeying what I've called you to do. But without the why, without a heart that longs to be with the Father and know him, it's just noise. That blows my mind. I'm, I am so good at doing the right thing. I'm really, really, really good at it. 
I, I'm telling you, I'm so good. Braggart. I'm so good at it. That makes one of us. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing, though. That's the thing. If I'm good at if I'm good at following the rules, but I don't have a heart that longs to know Jesus, I'm missing it. I'm absolutely missing it. I'm great at being a Bible Belt Christian. That is not what Jesus calls us to be. It's not. And if you're someone who rests like, like I did for the majority of my life, rest in the man I do that's all right. We're missing it. Commandments aren't the linchpin. Commandments aren't the thing that we hang on. It's the love of Jesus. It's the fact that God in his perfection, needing nothing from us, the triune God, who has everything he can possibly need, created us, looks at us and says, I love you. Despite everything. That's what it rests on. Commandments aren't the linchpin. The love of Jesus is. Would y'all pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for humbling me. Thank you for your love. I'm so grateful that we have Revelation chapter 2. So we can be reminded that when we get into those moments where we go, man, I'm so good at this. that you humble us and remind us that's not the point. The point is not that you're good at, the po- that good at this. The point is that I'm good at this. The point is that you died for us. The point is that you saved us. The point is that we can't save ourselves. And so you did it for us. The point is that we continually fall short. And even when we think we're doing it all right, by our Bible Belt cultural standards, we are crushing it. You remind us that we need you so bad. And without you, we are fallen and we are broken. Lord, help us to remember and to rest in your love above all other things. And to lean on you when we don't understand. And it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Lord, I come. I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one who guides my heart Lord I need
I had never thought, um, Levi, I'd never, I've heard this verse over and over again, the first love verse. I'd never tied it into the Jeremiah verse. You thought I was playing on my phone, but I was actually looking stuff up. <laughs> hey, Jacob, can you find, it was early in his message, that Jeremiah slide about the first love. The reason I want to bring this up is I, I'd never understood this first love verse, and then when he put the Jeremiah verse in there, I thought, oh, this makes sense. It's, it's wilderness love. It's the love that'll go anywhere. Like the love, yeah, bride followed me into the wilderness. Like it's a love that'll be like, oh, honey, I'd follow you anywhere. You remember that, Jill? Actually, Joel, you remember that? Oh, you couldn't ever make me mad. When I talk to couples, one of the things they say, oh, we could just be alone, and I knew I was in love with them, because we could be alone and not say anything. That first wilderness, going into the desert, love that involves decrease, not increase. I love being in a church congregation like this one, where there's a lot of college students. Because college students understand decrease. They understand living on less. But somehow it does shift eventually and we start to build wealth and equity. And Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? But it isn't the first thing, the wilderness love. So teach my song to rise to you. my song, so teach my song to rise to you, when temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. appreciate that, man. <laughs> nah, man, you added to that, man. You no stacked it up. Oh, well. I'm trying to be humble now, you know. No. Well, I have the discussion questions behind me, you guys, for, um, and I hope it facilitates good discussion for whatever, car rides, lunch, city group, whatever. Um, uh, if, if, if you're like me and your whole life, even just remembering back to your childhood and you, your identity was based in how good you were at following the rules and how good you were at doing it right. And I don't know, fighting for the approval of whoever, I don't know. I pray this passage is encouraging to you because those, those are good things. 
But without our first love, it doesn't mean anything. It is just a clanging gong. It is worthless to us. I pray you guys really meditate on that first love this week, you guys. I really do. You are so adored by your king. He loves you so much. He loved you first. I love you guys too, and we'll see you guys next week. Y'all have a great week.